Right. So uh, a lot of your books you write uh, just by yourself. You're the only author on, but some of them you've co-written. And you and your son launched a book back in 2019 with the title Demons and Spirits in Biblical Theology, Reading the Biblical Text in Its Cultural and Literary Context. And about that book, I've listened to a couple of your other interviews. I've heard you say something like it was about 90% your son's work and about 10% yours. Uh, so number one, is that still, uh, did I get that right? And number two, uh, would you have written that book differently or at all without uh, having your son uh, maybe poking the bear a little bit? <laughs> yeah, the, I'd say the 90-10 is probably still about accurate. And um, no, I wouldn't have written it at all. I wouldn't have uh, tried to attempt such a book on my own. Um, I, it, he had done a lot of thinking in his graduate work on the master's level on that topic. And, but he wanted to deal with the ancient Near East quite a bit. And that's not his area of expertise. So he prompted me to write an article about demons and spirits in the ancient Near East. And so I did that, and I was comfortable doing that. I published that article, um, and uh, but then that became a chapter uh, in the book. But m much of the rest of the book, uh, he he was framing on his own. Now at the same time, you know, we talk about Satan and the the idea of Satan and the serpent, and the question of the fall of Satan. Those are things I dealt with before, and I was very happy to deal with them. And we worked together on those sections. But certainly his whole his whole thing with uh, New Testament and with problem of evil and all of those things are not things that I I would have felt that I could write about. But I was really pleased with the work he did. Yeah. It was uh, a challenging book. I read through it and had to reread several portions of it. <laughs> I get to the end of a section and I was like, I think I understand what <laughs> what I just read. So I was able to go back through. Uh, one of the Facebook group members, Jeremy Smith, has three questions kind of based on the content of that book. So we'll start with uh, kind of the most broad question, which he asks, could Dr. Walton respond to the criticism of his book, Demons and Spirits and Biblical Theology? Uh, a couple of uh, examples he gave, Thomas uh, J. Farrar published a review in the Journal of Theological Studies, uh, published by Oxford Press. I'll put a link in the show notes to that article that's available online, at least the author's version of that. And then he also mentions that Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, before he passed, uh, released a podcast episode critiquing the book. And he also says, I understand if you'd rather not respond to Dr. Heiser's critique, considering uh, that he is no longer with us. I know, I... I on one level, I don't mind. Um, in general, I don't typically try to go out there and respond to critiques. I, I could spend my whole life responding to critiques. I do controversial things. And um, when you do controversial things, you have to expect that people will critique it, and that's fine. Uh, you have to expect that people will disagree with it. That's fine. You have to expect that people will sometimes misunderstand it. That's unfortunate. Uh, but it happens. And so, uh, I, like I said, I typically don't don't go about doing that. So um, I don't know that I would necessarily want to go through Farrar's review point by point. Um, he's going to have some different conclusions, and that's okay. If he didn't buy the the position that we tried to build, that's okay. We don't expect everybody to agree with us, and so there are always points of conversation, points of of negotiation and things that could be said differently or, you know, and if he comes up with different concerns, that's, that's fine. I see that he thinks that we are unjustifiably minimalistic. We don't think it's unjustifiable. And so that those are just the, the ways that you negotiate in the academic world. My feeling is uh, we put out there in the book, the best case we could make with the conclusions as clearly as we could lay them out. And then it's up to people to do with it what they want. And we've just tried to put information on the table, offer a perspective. Some people will find it helpful. Other people will get all worked up about it. And that doesn't matter. With regard to Mike Heiser, you know, Mike and I were friends. And 
Um, we had many conversations over the years. Uh, we agreed on lots of points of methodology uh, in terms of the importance of the ancient Near East and reading it in light of its culture. We, we were in agreement with that. But we also had many disagreements about where you go from there and what conclusions could be drawn with regard to various texts. So, for instance, he believed that since the text spoke about a divine council, that there must be one. Um, and for me, that's just like solid sky or like platonic ideas of, of body and soul. Just because the Bible speaks about it, that could be reference, not affirmation. And in that podcast, I was really very confused because Michael didn't seem to grasp this distinction between reference and affirmation, which I was, I was surprised at. Um, there were many times in his podcast where he said, I don't understand how Walton could say that. Or what does Walton do with XYZ passage? And I'm thinking, well, those XYZ passages that you mentioned are actually treated in the book. Did, did you read it? You can see what I did with it. It's right there. And if he doesn't understand my thinking, I would have hoped that he would have asked me instead of just talking about how he didn't understand my thinking. Uh, so I was, I was really confused by it um, that, uh, that he came, came out the way that he did. So he chose to speak publicly from his admitted lack of understanding instead of asking me for clarification. And that was, that was disappointing. Um, so I felt like he really didn't understand what we were doing. And, but he didn't invite me onto the podcast to have a conversation about it. So I didn't, didn't have that chance to interact with him. Yeah. Well, and I know a lot of people, he's been a, a very popular uh, person to follow for a number of years. His podcast has obviously um, garnered a lot of attention o over the years. And so he's done a lot of good work and he's kind of built a system, um, especially about this spiritual world that uh, people have uh, followed and bought into and uh, understood from his perspective. And so, yeah, I kind of wish uh, you two had had the chance to maybe interact a little bit more uh, about that critique as well. So uh, a couple of follow-up questions from Jeremy. Uh, and they're coming maybe from that uh, Heiser perspective or some of the Heiser teachings. Uh, just to clarify, are there actual spiritual entities? Uh, so even if we may not be able to identify them, that are acting as patron deities that are being worshipped as gods by the nations. That's not something that I think the text decides for us. Uh, and it's not something we can decide from the text because of all this concept of reference and affirmation. It certainly portrays those kinds of issues out there, but it's not really talking about them into the way that we try to sort through things in metaphysics. So I'm not sure that we can arrive at those conclusions. I believe that there are actual spiritual entities, lest anybody misunderstand me. Yeah. I believe that there are spiritual entities out there. But Jeremy's question asks if they're acting as patron deities and being worshiped as gods. That's another question. And I can't really address that uh, based on the information I have in the text. Yeah, so maybe in an Old Testament context, they would yeah. have been worshipped as that, but whether they were acting as that is maybe a question we can't answer. Well, the, the peoples, the Babylonians and Egyptians are worshipping what they believe are gods, yeah. what they believe are active spiritual agents. Are they actual spiritual agents? That's what we don't know. So, and uh, again, a follow-up question to maybe some of these same ideas. How should we understand the plagues from Exodus if the plagues were possibly directed against Egyptian deities? Does it indicate that there are actual spiritual beings behind such deities? No, I don't think it implies that. Uh, the plagues address the world in which they occurred. And they make meaningful points to Israelites and Egyptians based on what they believed. Uh, so if the Egyptians believed that these were gods, then the plagues are acting against those purported gods. 
even if the Israelites believed that the Egyptians' gods were actually gods. Same thing, the plagues are operating against them, but that's still working within the world of accommodation. And that doesn't say, yes, there actually were gods. Yeah, good. Well, leaving uh, that topic for a little bit, thanks, Jeremy, for all those questions. 